Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor for me to introduce uh, my colleague Lillian Mansour. In 1995, uh, she returned to the Michelle Bauman Underwood Department of Modern Languages and Literatures at the University of Miami, where she completed her undergraduate degree with a concentration in French and Spanish. She returned to Miami after finishing an MA and PhD in Spanish from the University of Southern California, and after working as an assistant professor of comparative literature at the University of California at Irvine. Uh, Lillian has been very prolific uh, as a researcher and scholar. She has published two monographs, over 40 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters, one special issue, two documentaries. She has also uh, designed and led five digital humanities projects uh, and has served widely as a dramaturg and literary advisor for more than 20 projects. She has also led 11 exhibits and theater festivals and has curated a film series and one thing that characterizes Mansour's work is her capacity, capability of engaging in big picture thinking. Her publications make groundbreaking contributions in many areas, such as Caribbean and Cuban studies, Latin American and Caribbean theater studies, ethnic Latinx and diasporic studies, and digital archi archival scholarship. Since it is impossible to summarize in a few minutes my colleagues' many accomplishments, I would like to briefly mention some of her most important contributions. Her first monograph, Borges Escher, uh, Sardu y Cobra, Un Encuentro Postmoderno, uh, published by Pliegos in 1996, studies the intersection of visual and verbal representations in the works of Jorge Luis Borges, Mauricio Escher, and Severo Sardui. Using a postmodern lens, Dr. Mansour analyzes the interaction between painting and literary representation in 20th century Latin American and Caribbean literature. Her second book, which is what we are going to be discussing today, is entitled Marginality Beyond Return, U.S. Cuban Performances in the 1980s and the 1990s, and was published by Routledge in 2022. And it is the first monograph to study Cuban and U.S. Cuban theater to analyze and document the evolution from Hispanic to Latinx theater using Cuban artists and writers as a case study. She will share with us more details about the contents of this book, but I would like to highlight what I consider three of the key contributions of this monograph. First, it connects with the work done by Lillian curating the Cuban Digital Theater Archive, which I will mention later on, by including several of its contents as primary material for the analysis proposed in the book. Second, it includes the analysis conducted by one of the founding scholars of performance and theater studies in the US, who has dedicated several decades to witness and document Cuban performances and theater, and finally, it connects the work done by Cuban performers and theater writers with other Latinx uh, communities. At the same time, it bridges the work done by Cubans in the island and in the diaspora. Dr. Mansour has also edited and co-edited for anthologies that are regarded as significant contributions in Latin American, Caribbean, and Latinx stories. The first one, uh, Latinas on Stage, uh, published by Third Women Press and in collaboration with Alicia Rison, is considered by many colleagues as a visionary contribution on gender and feminist studies at the intersection of Latinx theater and performance studies. Her other co-edited volumes do what that important and oftentimes invisible work of collecting theatrical pieces and critical work about theatrical pieces so they can be accessible to readers and researchers. And that's the case of Teatro Cubano Actual, eh, Teatro Venezolano en el Siglo XX, and Teatro de las Tres Américas, Antología Norte, which is uh, currently uh, forthcoming. Aside from her many publication, publications, Lillian has also been working on a series of digital scholarship projects, a field in which she has been a founding figure and a trendsetter. I would like to mention only one, but I think it's the, her baby, actually, the Cuban Theater Digital Archive, a monumental digital repository of visual and textual materials from many Cuban plays that has allowed many performance scholars to access video recordings of live performances, photographs, and scripts of Cuban and Latinx plays and performances. Her theater documentation and videos include more than 200 plays and performances that are in the process of becoming publicly available through the digital archive and on the Vimeo platform. This is a labor of love to which Lillian has devoted many, many hours, and her work is deeply valued by generations of scholars in theater and performance studies. 
Dr. Hamansor has recently received grants from the National Council for the Performing Arts, the Rockefeller Fellowship, the Smithsonian Institution, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, and a National Endowment for the Humanities Summer Institute. He has, is already working on two new research projects. The first one is Sites That Speak, a digital cultural map of Spanish language performing arts spaces in Miami. And her second project is a collection of women's testimonials in Latin America. Her research also includes a public facing component as she also continues to serve as dramaturg and cultural advisor for theater companies in the United States and Cuba. I would like to close with a personal note. Lilian Mansour interviewed me, uh, hired me, and convinced me to come to UM and Miami. When I arrived to UM, I already knew about Lilian due to her visibility in Caribbean studies and in theater and performance studies more specifically. What I did not know was how this theater lower and performera was going to transform my intellectual and professional life. Lilian is like many theater people, what in Puerto Rico we'll call an embelequera. <laughs> she loves to curate spaces for collective creativity, le gusta inventar, to take advantage of the synergies among colleagues, communities, and disciplines. She's also a community builder. In the Department of Modern Languages and Literature, she's a mentor and a model colleague who finds ways to be constructive and supportive of her colleagues' teaching and research interests. At UM, almost everybody knows and respects Lillian because she has earned the appreciation and gratitude of many of her colleagues by selflessly and generously serving in many committees and academic units at the College of Arts and Sciences and the university at large. When you go to Lillian with an idea, her response is usually enthusiastic. Her eyes have a special sparkle, she smiles, and that is how you know that she's already strategizing to make things happen. Life is for Lillian a big theater in which we're always engaging in our greatest and best performances. There is a legendary story of a performance night Lillian organizing her home to promote community building among my colleagues in the Department of La 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 Modern Languages that I'm sorry I missed because it seems it was really transformative. So I would like to close this presentation quoting one of her colleagues in the field who says the following about Lillian. Professor Lillian Mansour exemplifies the scholar educator of the 21st century a border crosser and a bridge builder. She acknowledges and activates the power of expressive culture to bring people together. Resisting the well-traveled routes, she opens new roads. In doing so, she has expanded the theoretical landscape, developed new methodologies, and provided models for future scholarships in the humanities. So congratulations, Lillian, in the publication of your book, and thank you for allowing me to learn from your scholarship and to witness your intellectual generosity, your collegiality, and your fierce creativity. Thank you so much, <coughs> Yolanda, for... Um, those kind words and uh, uh, more than generous introduction. Um, and of course, special thank you. Um, if it hadn't been for Yolanda's support and uh, big push uh, a few years ago, this book probably wouldn't be uh, you know, uh, published, it wouldn't be uh, in press. Um, I'd like to thank also the Center for the Humanities and the Cuban, uh, Cuban uh, Heritage Collection for sponsoring this event tonight. And of course, to all of you for, for being here with me. This book is an exploration of US Cuban theater, mainly between 1980 and 2000. I analyzed the work of playwrights Magali Alabao, Jorge Ignacio Cortinas, Marirene Fornes, Eduardo Machado, Manuel Martin Jr., and Carmelita Tropicana, as well as the participation of these playwrights in three foundational Latino theater projects. I also study theatrical projects of reconciliation between Cubans inside and outside the island in the early 2000s. Demonstrating the foundational nature of these artists and projects, the book argues that US Cuban theater problematizes both the exile and Cuban American paradigms. In addition, the changes that this theater was registering forces us to review the historiography of Latino theater itself. The introduction begins with an analysis of Lourdes Casal's famous poem for Anna Belfort, which informs the title of this book and offers an entry point to the processes of identity formation discussed throughout. The title, Marginality Beyond Return, 
points towards the ad oddness, the in-between position Casal captured poetically in her verses, which in, in turn embody for me the predicament of Cuban cultural identity in the US. US Cubans carry within ourselves a marginality which makes us too Cuban to be American, yet also too American to be anything else. This is indeed a marginality immune to all return to our Cubas or to our Americas, immune to static processes of gender, sexual, ethnic, or national identification along uh, essentialist lines. <clears throat> the introduction analyzes the time frame of this study, the 1980s and 1990s, as well as key words that are used throughout, theater and performance versus drama, ensemble versus repertoire and assemblage, U.S. Cuban versus Cuban American, audience, both real and implied, theory in the flesh, identity, uh, indifference, uh, hybridity, and meta-representation. My analysis focuses on the performance, uh, the performative aspect of theater that is on the transformations from its written version to the stage spectacular one. The genres of live theater and performance art, as opposed to scripts or drama, embody and figure precisely the place where the intersection between live bodies and cultural construction become visible and thus can be studied. As performance, as live process in relation to reception, theater presents a unique way to discuss questions of identity and identity formation, as well as identity in relation to aesthetic and social projects. My primary texts then are mainly performances and my reading of them takes the performative as a critical and theoretical tool. In choosing theater and performance as my primary text of cultural analysis, I'm not suggesting a one-to-one -one correspondence between theater and the hybrid subject or between theater and social change, between representation and the real. Theater appropriates mechanisms of cultural mediation which go beyond the stage. Theater, however, is a cultural production which displays its own organizational ensemble as a, style, as a style of meta representation, as representation about representation. Meta representation as a device allows us to see and read how representation functions both within theater and within a social historical context. And I just see a lot of representation, representation. I should have <laughs> read this out loud, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what happens when you couple up uh, sections. My apologies. So theater then provides a space for seeing processes of social change, and talking about theater provides us the space to, the space to, ad to address those processes in a keenly theoretical fashion. My analysis of life performance also inserts theater into the broader context of other mediascapes and reads theory in relation to other idioscapes, mainly that of popular music. Music is deployed as an integral part of most of the performances I study. The titles and starting point of my chapters are also borrowed from popular music because for Cubans and Latinas in the US, popular music functions as one of many cultural markers of Cuban and Latina consciousness. It thus becomes a medium of symbolic cultural communication. In this sense, Alexandra Vasquez's theoretical construct of listening in detail has enriched my reading on the use of music in this place, and it is fundamental to the ways in which I analyze the entanglements of music, race, and culture. Cuban American production entered the Latino studies canon in the late 1980s and has garnered crit critical attention since then. It had remained marginal to Chicano Latino studies, given the critics' preponderance to read it as a culture in exile rather than as a moment of US cultural production. Despite its many contributions, book length studies about Cuban American literature are few when compared to Chicano studies, New York studies, and Latino studies at large. Theater, with rare exceptions, is usually not included in these analyses, although it was one of the first art form of Cubans in both Miami and New York, and arguably the one closest to post-1959 early exile communities. Marginality is the first critical book dedicated solely to U.S. Cuban theoretical production, thus remedying the lack of scholarly attention to such an important corpus of theater and performances. Methodologically, I conduct a historiography of the two decades in which the plays were written and or produced, the decade of the Hispanic in the 1980s and the decade of the Latino in the 1990s. 
I analyze archi archival materials related to the artist's theater making practice um, and reconstruct the performances. I analyze stage uh, and custom designs, musical scores, documentary videos, theater reviews, my own notes, interviews with the artist, and other archival ephemera. The main argument of this book is that concepts of exile, national identification, ethnicity, diaspora, and transnationalism are all insufficient to address US Cuban identity and performances. Furthermore, I contend that studied as an ensemble, US Cuban theater and performance call into question foundational literary and sociological studies of Cuban Americans, as well as the historiographical teleology of both Cuban American and Latino theaters. He proposes that this theatrical ensemble, contrary to other forms of Cuban American cultural production, performs a concept of identity indifference that is hybrid and chaotic, and that challenges and exceeds Cuban, both on and off the island, Latine, and U.S. norms. U.S. Cuban theater, as this book demonstrates, comprises a wide variety of plays written in English, Spanish, and Spanglish, published and unpublished, staged and unproduced, in Miami, as well as in other cities, mainly New York, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Chicago, and San Francisco. I became interested in U.S. Cuban theater outside of Miami, of the Miami area, because it is a moment of cultural production, which, I've, um, as I've suggested, problematizes both the exile and the Cuban American paradigms. Those who advocate an understanding of Cuban identity as an exile mentality, unlike the identity of other Latinos who immigrate for supposed economic reasons, argue that this identity is characterized by a refusal to become part of the American immigrant history. The exile persists in seeing him herself unproblematically as Cuban. The Cuban American, on the other hand, is generally characterized by means of an assimilationist rhetoric. As supporter of American middle class values, the Cuban American sees himself as part of the melting pot which constitutes contemporary US culture. In contrast to both paradigms, the plays I analyze here propose a hybrid and intersectional model of identity which refutes simple and exclusive identification with either the culture of origin or American culture. They thus offer the possibility of reconfiguring in and as performance a collective Latino identity which takes into consideration issues of racism, sexism, heteronormativity, linguistic stratification, national identity, and ideological stances. By investigating U.S. Cuban theater then, I theorize via performance ways in which we can intervene in and reformulate political and representational positioning within the context of hybrid cultural identities. Furthermore, I argue that U.S. Cuban theater offers models to preview and predict alternative opportunities and experiences of Cubanity in the future. Sorry. The time frame of the performances included in this study spans, like I mentioned, the mid-1980s through the early 2000s. This specificity is crucial. These years were characterized in the US by a highly contentious discussion about the role of the arts. They coincide with the so-called Latino boom, as well as the obscenity censorship controversy at the, in the National Endowment of the Arts and the need to go multicultural by many theatrical institutions. It is also the period of three foundational projects in Latino theater, in which I discuss, uh, which I discuss throughout the book. Marirene Fornese's direction of Intar's Hispanic Playwrights in Residence Laboratory in New York from 1980 to 1991, Hispanic Playwrights Project at South Coast Repertory Theater in Costa Mesa, California, 1986 to 2004, and the Latino Theater Initiative at Mark Taper Forum in Los Angeles, 1992 to 2005. The selection of plays that were produced during this period depended upon political, economic, and social factors as much as, if not more than, the quality of the plays themselves. Thus, my choice of focusing on plays produced precisely during this period must consider the political, economic, and social spheres of both mainstream theatrical institutions and the marginal ones. Marginality Beyond Return, then, is the study of contemporary U.S. Cuban theatrical production as a performance of the multiple in-betweens of identity indifference. These multiple in-betweens produce 
inappropriate others whose subjectivities fail to conform to the US and Cuban norms of cultural intelligibility and thus challenge the coherence of both forms. While most of these in-betweens are at work at the same time, Cuban versus US norms of masculinity and femininity, of whiteness and blackness, of heteronormativity and queerness, I address them separately for the sake of analysis in individual, in individual chapters. The first chapter Did I? The first chapter, Mr. Don't Touch the Banana, Transculturation, Networks of Proximity, and U.S. Cuban Theater, presents the historical and cultural debates within which U.S. Cuban playwrights studied in this book started to develop their work and that regional and community theaters began to produce them. Historically, it offers a different chronology, a different critical chronology of, Q of Cuban migration to the U.S., primarily to Miami. Although Miami, as a city and site for U.S. Cuban theater projects, did not figure prominently during the 1980s and 1990s, Miami exile culture haunts some of the artists studied, and in the 21st century, Miami becomes the site for these artists' transnational connections with Cuban theater on the island. And let me read just a, a little section of the introduction to this uh, chapter one. Miami, Cuba, May, June, 1991. I traveled from Los Angeles to Miami to attend the Sixth International Hispanic Theater Festival. I was really going to see one play, La Verdadera Culpa de Juan Clemente Senea, written by Abilio Esteves, a Cuban playwright residing in Cuba, who is now living in Spain, staged by Prometeo, a Latina University Theater Group in Miami, and directed by Alberto Sarraín, a Cuban emigre who would, rather, who would later move to Venezuela and eventually return to Miami, this was the first play written by a contemporary Cuban playwright residing on the island to be staged in Miami. On the way home in Miami, the radio station La Cubanissima was playing a song I had not heard before. The tune seemed to be an upbeat salsa song about Shango, the thunder god, the thunder god in Santeria. However, the song turned out to be about three confused Anglo-Americans who, not understanding this Afro-Cuban ritual, misread the fruits in the altar's offerings to Shango as a buffet table. The Anglo misreading is mis misinterpreted in turn by the Madrina, who construes the, Anglos, the Anglo's move as horrendous and sacrilegious. She warns them accordingly in the refrain, Mr. Don't Touch the Banana, Banana belong to Chango. I can't sing. <laughs> but uh, for those of you in Miami, you probably know the song. Um, moreover, to avoid any linguistic confusion, the refrain is repeated in Spanish. La banana is the Chango. Yeah. Yeah. Willy Chirino's song, Mr. Don't Touch the Banana, provides us an access to that very complex urban space many call Miami, Cuba. A bilingual city officially since 1973, and now in prototypical, prototypical multilingual world city, Miami is a cultural, economic, and political center of the U.S. Cuban ethnarchy. An economic, cultural, and political gateway to the Caribbean and South America, Miami can be characterized as a contact zone uh, in the sense of uh, Mary Louise Pratt, who describes the term as, and I quote, that space in which people, geographically and historically separated, come into contact with each other and establish ongoing relations, usually involving conditions of coercion, radical inequality, and intractable conflict, end quote. In this contact zone called Miami, the Cuban Latina population stands out for being drastically different from other US cities with a predominantly Latino population. First of all, few in this city identify themselves as Latinas in any of the multiple variations of this term, Latina, Latino, Latinx, Hispanic, Hispano, etc. Um, furthermore, it is rather common for white Miami Cubans and other white Latinas to say that they have never experienced discrimination, neither racial nor linguistic. Indeed, indeed, it was not until I left Miami for graduate school in Southern California that I experienced both, for, both forms of discrimination intersectionally with sexism. And it was not until much, much later that I could actually articulate those experiences in relation to different levels of social formation. The very name Miami Cuba captures the nature of this space as contact zone. 
Alejandro Portes and Alex Stepik described the city of Miami as an anomaly for social, sci social scientists since it defies traditional methodological tools. They argue that Miami, while part of the U.S., is not like any other urban centers in this country. Furthermore, it does not, and I quote them, does not fit very well more recent descriptions of a social mosaic composed of established ethnic groups that maintain certain elements of their culture under the hegemonic umbrella of a white Protestant elite. In Miami, the fragments of the mosaic are loose and do not come together in any particular pattern, in any familiar pattern, end quote. The Latino Anglo contact here, which is very different from the Black Anglo contact and the Haitian Anglo contacts, all underscore the existing ethno-racial inequalities in the city in terms of occupation, income and poverty, as well as related special inequ spatial inequalities, as her colleague Laura Conwood Wood has argued. In this contact zone, at least in reference to the Latino Anglo contact, which is very, very different uh, from the others, it could be said that there's not one hegemonic class or ethnicity, not one mainstream. Instead, we have a series of parallel structures with their own institutions and organizations. Cubans and other Latinas will tell you that they are the ones who set the cultural pace for restaurants, music, clothing styles, and of course, politics. <laughs> As Chirino's song so effectively demonstrates, from the point of view of the Cubans, it is the Anglos who make the cultural mistakes and not the recent immigrants. And the non-Latino English speakers are the ones who have to learn how to read different cultural codes and how to perform in different cultural and business spaces. Um, so informed by Cold War history, this chapter presents and critiques the, the Cuban success narrative and debunks the exceptionalism of this narrative. It continues with an analysis of anthropological theories of transculturation, constructing it to the, construct, contrasting it to the ways in which multiculturalism was deployed in the U.S. during the decade of the Hispanic and the decade of the Latino. It is within these cultural and academic debates, like I mentioned, that U.S. Cuban playwrights began to develop their work. Their playwrights and productions studied enter the, the mainstream as Latino artists, but their work, like that of other Latino writers during the 1980s and 90s, performed a critical multiculturalism that worked against the homogenizing and commodifying tendencies of the period. The productions performed a critique of Cuban and American exceptionalism present at the time in Cuban and Cuban American studies and American studies. The chapter ends theorizing US Cuban identity as hybrid and chaotic, it borrows from cultural studies appropriation of scientific theories of chaos and fractals, as well as network theory. It reviews and critiques the literature that uses static approaches to identity formation, while it redeploys both the exile and ethnic category outside of essentialist and nationalist paradigms. Chapter two, Momento Renacentista, U.S. Cubans and Puerto Ricans, uh, U.S. Cubans and Latino off of Broadway focuses on the role U.S. Cubans and Puerto Ricans played in off of Broadway. This chapter grounds the book historically and places the artist in relation to Marirene Fornes and the 1960s and 1970s productions that set a precedent for their work. I analyze the work of Fornes and two U.S. Cuban theater artists who've involved, whose involvement in the off of Broadway movement has gone largely unnoticed, Magali Alabao and Manuel Martin Jr. Although Fornes is seen as a progenitor of the off-of-Broadway movement, no one has analyzed her first play, La Viuda. I present how the processes of hybridity and transculturation studied in the previous chapter were at work in their theatrical productions. Furthermore, I demonstrate how their retooling of themes and aesthetics coming from non-US traditions namely Latin American and European avant-garde theaters, were key to their theatrical processes. However, it was that very aesthetics and the use of Spanish language that remained unreadable to English language theater critics who pushed their work away from off of Broadway to the then nascent Spanish or Hispanic theater in New York. I begin the chapter um, with an analysis of Marirene Fornes La Viuda, The Widow, I analyzed it relating it to other works from Fornes off of Broadway period to prove that La Viuda already contains many of the theatrical techniques and language used by Fornes in her later work. 
I suggest that this place lack of critical attention is representative of the marginalization of Spanish language plays in that period. The second half of the chapter is devoted to Manuel Martins Jr. early work as actor, director, and playwright to demonstrate how he, alongside actress Magalia Lavao, Latinized, um, Latinized off of Broadway. The main objecti objectives of this chapter are to bring back three US Cuban theater artists to put them into dialogue within the networks of their Puerto Rican and Anglo off of Broadway contemporaries and to demonstrate how they shaped what I term Latine off of Broadway. Although these experimental theater pieces might not relate to Latine identity politics, nor are they solely part of Latino community-based activism, which is a ways in which uh, Latino theater uh, was thought of at the time, um, having in mind um, or the model the, of, uh, of Chicano theater, Teatro Campesino, etc. These plays, experimental plays, are nothing like that. So in spite, right, of, um, in spite of this, I argue that it is the hunting of ghosts from the past that endow these early works with an undeniable Cubanity. However, because that Cubanity was performed from a Cuban Latin American perspective in Spanish, the plays remain unreadable as off of Broadway plays, it remain unreadable as off of Broadway plays. The third chapter, Ay Mama Inés, Gender, Ethnicity, Blackness, and Racism, highlights the heretofore unrecognized pioneering gestures of U.S. Cuban theater in American and Cuban studies. It analyzes theater's response to the racial silences in constructs of national identity and its inscription of blackness into Cubanity. Informed by Latcrit theory, spectrality studies, Afro-Latino studies, and black feminist theory, it demonstrates how theater's validation of the African legacy in Cuban culture is performed through the deployment of elements historically coded as black in music, dance, and religion. Let's picture two different moments. The first one is Teatro Duo Theater, the off-of-Broadway space um, in New York in 1988, where Rita and Bessie, written and directed by Manuel Martin Jr., stages a fictional encounter between two subjects coded as minoritarian in the U.S., the blues singer Bessie Smith and the Cuban mulata singer Rita Montaner, and the negotiations among their multiple intersections. And I use mulata in, uh, in Spanish and in, um, in italics, um, so with the use that, uh, that mulata has uh, in Spanish. Um, I read Manuel Martins Jr., Rita and Bessie, to theorize the staging of transcultural processes of subject formation against the backdrop of a dominant culture's persistent racialization and objectification. Focusing on the intersections, the in-betweens of gender and blackness in Cuba and the US, on differing models of femininity along class, racial, and national boundaries, and of sexuality, I explore how configurations of identity as identity indifference are constructed and represented in and through this performance. In 1988, when Rita and Bessie was produced, scholarship about the queer divas of the blues and the queering of the Harlem Renaissance was nascent. Manuel Martin Jr. participated in that early recuperation of minority women artists to underscore their independence, including freedom in the realm of sexuality. Furthermore, this play staging of racialized constructions of blacks and of the performative markers of blackness in Cuba and in US Cuba antedate academic scholarship on this issue. Thus, this chapter underscores the primacy of performance over academic theorization on these topics. The second moment is 10 years later in, Camp in uh, Campo Santo Center for the Arts, a community theater in San Francisco, 1998, presenting Maleta Mulata, um, Mulata Suitcase, a world premiere non-equity production. During these 10 years, different alternative ways of thinking and feeling in coalition were being developed. Maleta is one of the very few US Cuban plays that openly confronts the constructions of blackness in Cuba and in the US. Written by Jorge Ignacio Cortinas, it was directed by Brazilian Japanese Paulo Nunes and had a multiracial cast of actors. Maleta Mulata 
unveils the homogenizing nationalist rhetoric of aquí no hay blancos ni negros, solo cubanos, which I analyze in an earlier portion of the chapter, and redresses the impact of that rhetoric on Cuban communities in the US. In an email dialogue on Maleta Mulata, Cortines told me the following, and I quote, Maleta was written in a sort of dialogue with several precursors, precursor texts, one of them being Ortiz contra Punteo Cubano. But I was, of course, also trying to find a way to talk about the strange relationship of my regeneration toward the United States, towards the promise of whiteness. I'm thinking here of Gustavo Perez Firmat and those who are my age and taking, and taking very seriously the generation Enya people, but also those who have never heard of him. How is it that some Cuban Americans like Perez Firmat are able to so steadfastly avoid ever imagining themselves as people of color? And what is the price we pay for this type of amnesia of the racial imagining?" End quote. Maleta Mulata is a response in part to, those, to these questions. The action takes place in 1980s Miami, right after the Mariel boat lift. It unfolds as a contrapunteo, a counterpoint in Ortiz's sense, between two sisters and the ghost of the past. Most importantly, the real, as opposed to metaphorical spirit, ghost of Barbarito, a mulatto musician who stayed in Cuba, and between the two sisters and their lives in the present, with two teenagers in the family. Maleta deals with the ghost of race and racism in Cuban culture with a highly poetic and evocative use of language that is reminiscent of the expressionistic techniques of Marilene Fornes. Affect and memory are crucial to the construction of character in this play. Informed by residual specters of willed and unwilled forgettings enacted through silence, memory is something that haunts both those who stayed in Cuba and those who left. The play presents a critique of Cuban America's deracial de imagining as it stages the transcultural experiences of younger US Cubans who have lived with other racialized Latinas. And I would like to read uh, uh, kind of the, the theory section of Maleta Mulata, part of the theory section of Maleta Mulata, to give you a sense of uh, different kinds of approaches, of theoretical approaches that um, I uh, developed throughout the book. This section is titled, From Blackness to Feeling Brown. Jose Esteban Munoz also was acu acutely aware that the term Latino does not subscribe to a common racial, class, gender, relig religious, or national category. This conundrum is the basis for Jose Esteban Munoz's theorization of brown in his posthumous book, The Sense of Brown. Informed by continental philosophy, Chicana, and other feminist of color theories, queer theorists, and performance artists, Munoz's book brings together various published and unpublished essays in which we can see how he developed his concerns with ethnicity and affect and his investments in theorizing black, brown, queer, and minor structures of feeling. Taking as a starting point W.E.B. Du Bois' question, what does it feel to be a problem, for Munoz, the sense of brown comes from subjects coded as minoritarian who feel apart and separate from mainstream society. However, it is a feeling that creates a sense of belonging. Difference can generate a shared feeling of being a problem. The response, especially the artistic and performative responses to feeling like a problem, and the ways in which those responses attune the members of the common and attune the audience to feeling that sense of brown are just as, if not more important, than their feeling of being devalued. Key to this attunement is the being alongside, next to, and with others, the being in contact or the conviviality that our performance facilitates, including the spaces, audiences, buildings, and networks of those contacts. Concepts that are key to Munoz and to my reading of Manuel Martins Jr., Rita and Bessie, and of Ignacio Cortinas' Maleta Mulata in this chapter are the various query colleges in the Brown Commons, the possibilities of interracial empathy, and the utopic potentiality of thinking and imagining otherwise. While Munoz's collection of essays was ahead of his time, his thinking may fall short within the current US discourses around blackness and colorism. In other words, the theorization of brownness was and is an important intervention in US racial discourses traditionally framed around the black versus white axis. But 
it may not be sufficient because of its failure to account for the seduction of whiteness and to recognize the difficulty for Hispanic Caribbean Latinas to see race. Furthermore, since Munoz is relying on a black studies tradition, which is embedded in Munoz's deep friendship and intellectual conversations with Fred, Fred Moten and Tavia Nyong'o, his theorization of Brown is not in conversation with discourses around mulataje developed in Latin American studies. I read Rita and Bessie and Maleta Mulata as precursor texts that led Munoz, Brown, that led Munoz uh, to theorize the Brown Commons, and most importantly, as texts that foreground the need to underscore multiple racial formation frameworks that exceed Munoz's Brown Commons, as well as US discourses around blackness and whiteness. In other words, I argue that these plays attune their audiences to the, intellect, to the intellectual racial conversation that will come in the field of Afro-Latino studies two decades later. As I demonstrate, both plays suggest that these discourses are historically and culturally specific and at the same time multiple and shifting when they encounter each other in the US. For both Martin and Cortinas, like for Munoz, this was a, a product of the playwrights' research on African-American cultural production, their engagement as queer subjects with African-American communities in the East and the West Coast of the US, and their experiences of feeling like a problem shared with both African-Americans and other Latinas. In the case of Martin, he was acutely aware of the racism against blacks in the US and wanted to unveil how that racism worked in Cuba and in Cuban communities in the US. Marti himself points out that part of the research for this play came from his studies on the history of black theaters in the US. He commented the following in an interview. I quote, I was appalled when I found out that in 1900, the year that Rita was born, blacks were lynched in the US. Among them, actors that were working and had to flee the theaters in which they were acting. That's when I started researching to see if Rita, given that she was so white, had tough encounters with racism, end quote. The unveiling of Cuban society's racist impulses is one of the issues performed in Rita and Bessie, along with the stereotypification of Latinos in the US. Additionally, Martin's connections with La Mama and his friendship with Ellen Stewart also gave him a glimpse of the then nascent black underground theatrical productions and multi-ethnic audiences' engagement with them. These experiences and networks allowed Martin to bring together a multiracial cast and artistic team. The play's musical director was the uh, 2021 Pulitzer Prize winner in music, Afro-Cuban pianist, composer, and director, Tania Leon. She was a founding member of Dance Theater of Harlem and conductor for the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater Company. The choreography was done by none other than dancer, choreographer, and teacher Walter Raines, the first black choreographer to work at the Royal Opera in London. He was charter member and director of the Dance Theater in ha of Harlem and chair of the ballet department of Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater Company during the 1980s. These two black artists, along with U.S. Cuban Randy Barceló, whose research on Afro-Cuban religious systems and culture infused his theatrical settings, were responsible for shaping the play's sonic, visual, and spectacular image, an image that attuned the audience to the multi-layered conversations performed in the play around brownness and blackness in the U.S., and around whiteness as a privilege and the seduction of whiteness in both the U.S. and Cuba. In the case of Cortinas, his engagement with African-American cultural production, specifically queer black, is visible in the stage production, but more subtle in, uh, in this play script. Cortinas included two verses from Essex Hemphill's, Hemphill's poem, Heavy Breathing, as an epigraph for Maleta Mulata. And I quote, what kind of mutants are we now? Why is some destruction so beautiful? End quote. The preface is followed by a dedication to Cortina's maternal and paternal grandmothers. Essex, uh, Essex Hemphill was an African-American gay poet, performance artist, and activist whose poetry and essays were groundbreaking for African-American literature. I argue that his poem is key to understanding Cortina's approach to memory, to racial imaginings, to constructions of masculinity, to queerness, and to the importance of beauty in this play. 
Heavy Breathing begins with a preface from Emesa Sayre's Return to My Native Land, a poetic move that connects Hemphill to one of the poets of the negative movement, whose work was so influential for his reconstruction of blackness. Whereas we can read the radical poetics of negritude in this poem, the poetic voice quickly, quickly distances itself from negritude's nationalism. It is precisely in Hemphill's critique of nationalism and in the poetic forms he used to express it in heavy breathing that I connect him to Cortinas. In Maleta Mulata, the placement of Hemphill's preface right above the dedication to Cortinas' grand, Cortinas's grandmothers subtly suggests where Cortinas comes from, literarily speak, speaking, and announces the, play's right, the playwright's arguments with his own ancestral memories as performed in the play. I believe Cortina shares and admires not only Hemphill's imagery, but he was also inspired by the theatricality of this poem and its critique of stereotypical black masculinity. Hemphill's poetry explores the African-American community and tradition to expose and criticize its strengths and weaknesses. And that exploration informed Cortinas' questioning of the exile community and its tradition, as well as the ambivalence towards his cultural inheritance. Furthermore, both artists in Cortinas' words, and I quote, explored queer and hybrid positions that are marginal within the marginal. Hemphill in, was interested in how these marginal subjects cobble an identity that makes sense to fractured psyches that are the result of the ruins of colonialism. And there is spectacular beauty in those ruins. Most importantly, Maleta Mulata performs a sense of collectivity and futurity that we find in Hemphill's poem, as well as in his other writings. In other words, Hemphill informs the ghost of race that haunts Maleta Mulata, along with its sustained questioning of a deracialized and unquestioned Cuban masculinity. <laughs> and so uh, the chapter, the second section, I proceed to analyze Maleta Mulata, uh, the performance. Um, I look at the multiracial ethnic cast, uh, an analysis of the characters, the sonic landscape, um, the, uh, uh, the, the use of Spanglish uh, in the play, um, which I don't have time to, uh, to share with you tonight. Um, and then uh, towards the end, uh, conclude that the play then sets the stage for that in-between situation of these characters, a dismembered community split into halves with a common suitcase in the middle, which both separates and unites the two. The maleta is full of memories, full of phantasmatic sounds and memories of loss and passion, of love and hate, of rejection and desire for its other half. The maleta is mulata not only because it refers literally to racial mixing. Metaphorically, what comes out of the suitcase of memory and history can no longer be seen in binaristic terms of either black or white, poor or middle class, here or there, English or Spanish, straight or gay. The ghost that Cortinas play so poetically brings to life, the racialized past that Martin presents, as well as the characters that have been created, forces to reconsider this contrapunteo mulato between past and present, between African Americans and Latinos, as they unpack, as they unpack race, loss, and desire. Martin's and Cortinas' different entanglement, engagement with blackness and racism in Cuban culture, intersectionally with gender and, hom and homosexuality, was a pioneering gesture, and the spaces in which these gestures were first performed, Duo Theater in New York and Camposanto in San Francisco, are important for this argument. Teatro Duo Theater's audience tended to be primarily white Anglos and Latinos, whereas Camposanto's audience in San Francisco was as multi-ethnic and multiracial as Maleta Mulata's cast. But they both foster audiences that could be attuned to these gestures. Their performance of blackness and racism in Cuban culture, as I mentioned, antedated academic scholarship on the subject and presented Afro-Latinos on stage before scholarship recognized their existence. Needless to say, blackness and brownness are lived very different as are black and brown gender and sexual differences. I'm not suggesting that these two plays are equating or flattening those experiences. I argue that in their racialization of US Cubans, their critique of gender and sexuality, and their unique soundscapes, they expose differences as well as many points of commonality with other Latinas in the US. 
their cultural specificity makes us think about the effective states of black gay cultural activism and the points of commonalities and differences with brown gay cultural activism. Furthermore, although the poetic language of Maleta Mulata is very different from the language used in Rita and Bessie, there's also something brown about their use of their language. Language gives us a sense of the ways in which these characters seem to feel isolated and not in sync with the brownness of Avastor Commons. It's not a story of being, but instead a story of being without. In other words, Martins and Cortinas' explorations of blackness led them and their audience to the affect that Munoz theorizes. These two playwrights continued to write plays that did not have Cuban characters or subject matter. But the beauty of language, their sonic registers, and the spectacular nature of Rita and Bessie and Maleta Mulata's performances attune their audiences to that feeling of being in common. Their contrapuntal articulation of race, sexuality, memory, and desire gives us a, a sense of futurity in that they allow us to imagine very different Cuban and US futures. I'm gonna go quickly. Um, yeah, so chapter four, La Vida en Rosa, Carmelita Tropicana's performative excess, focuses specifically on US Cuban performance art. It looks at how the body is used in feminist performance as both means and repository of a split historical memory and, uh, and personal memory of US Cuban women. The chapter begins with an analysis of the construction of Carmelita Tropicana's performing persona through theories of tropicalization. I then read Memories of the Revolution, a play uh, that was performed in 1986, focusing on the use of humor or choteo and on the use of ethnic camp or piquencia and jestic moments. Piquencia, in its Cuban version, consists of a scandalous mixture of objects and forms which are utilized as cultural signs. It is synonymous with bad taste, bad taste, of course, in relation to Eurocentric aesthetic codes. I analyze how the jestic moments in the performance inscribe a racialized sexual fantasy within a lesbian dynamic of desire. By studying the play's critical reception, I argue that to read the complexity and ambiguity of these jestic moments, we need to address the entanglements of sexuality, racialization processes, and geopolitics. The play de-essentialized and racialized the lesbian spectatorial community before critical writings on the subject. And the play was performed uh, in uh, the Wow Cafe in, uh, in New York, which is what well, was uh, traditionally um, a, uh, a lesbian space and in the very beginnings, primarily a white lesbian space. The second half of the chapter focuses on with what ass does the cockroach sit? Sorry about the, about the title, 2004. This one woman play rewrites a Spanish folk tale of Cucarachita Martina, the cockroach that, emer that eventually marries the mouse Perez, and uses as a backdrop the Elian Gonzalez international conflict of 1999-2000 and Cuban exile politics. Tropicana performs a whole array of animals, parodies heartline political positions in Cuba and in Miami, and highlights the importance of affective relationships. My reading of this queer political fable and of the queer cabaret memorias interconnects the arguments which have been presented separately in the previous chapters, focusing on the intersections of gender and ethnicity, sexuality, and national identity, sexuality, and politics. Moreover, it situates those performances historically and artistically as precursors of the cross Cuban performances, which are discussed in the next chapter, which is the last chapter. And just a few words about that. <laughs> so chapter five, Todos por lo mismo, from bridges to greater Cuba, looks at the ways in which Cuban and US Cuban theaters from part and respond to a plurality emanating from social historical, displays, uh, social historical displacement and cultural discontinuities. I analyzed several festival and plays, including Repertorio Español's production of Eduardo Machado's Revoltillo in Miami and Cuba, which is the first uh, US Cuban production performed on the island. The first monologue performance festival, which brought to Miami 27 theater artists residing on the island, and Alberto Sarraín's Miami Havana co-production of Alberto Estorino's Parece Blanca in Cuba. 
by studying plays across the spectrum of Cuban diaspora theater, both exile and US Cuban theaters, I offer models to study uh, Cuban theater. I offer models to study Cuban theater um, produced on and off the island as a product of cultural dispersion. The staged encounters in this last chapter, however, move the discussion to the, of the national and the ethnic in Cuba and the US to a transnational perspective. I suggest the need to study Cuban theater on and off the island as a product of and within this cultural dispersion. This chapter closes the book with a reading which performatively operates as an intellectual encounter between our dramaturgies. It also engages transnational Latino studies as it argues for a theater of greater Cuba, a non-geographical cultural space that moves us away from the traditional island exile dichotomy. Finally, in this future focus chapter, I demonstrate the power of theater and performance over diplomacy and political science and explore how theater offers a productive and innovative take on where U.S. Cuba relations and cultures could go in the future. Thank you very much. I have a long list of thank yous. I mean, New York, this book has been many years in the making. You know, I've New York, colleagues at Irvine, where I started, artists in Miami, um, artists in Cuba, University of Miami, my colleagues, uh, students from university from MLL who are now uh, my colleagues, Caribbean Studies Writing Group, uh, University of Miami Libraries Cuban Heritage Collection, um, special thanks uh, to those of you from the CHC uh, for putting up with me so many years, <laughs> you know, asking uh, for materials. Can you please scan, et cetera? Can you please process? Archivists uh, elsewhere, friends and family in Miami, funding, and uh, of course, uh, Daniel Correa and Daniel Correa Mansor, my husband and my son, who have put up with me all these years. <laughs> time for questions, but I'll also just interject quickly that for those of you who would like to uh, buy the book, you can order it uh, on the way out. And I'll just, uh, I'll let you call on people, but I'll take the mic around. Surely somebody has a question. <laughs> Actually, I, I did. I, I wanted to thank you so much. I'm really excited to, to see this book in production. It, it's just a brief question. No, I, I appreciated the, the, the comparisons with, with the long um, history of Chicano theater and um, that there hasn't really any been any long sort of longitudinal studies such as yours on Cuban theater. I'm just wondering what, and that they sort of happened separately. I was just wondering what the early, if there, what conversations, if any, there were between the dramaturgs in theater such as Teatro Campesino and um, the early, you know, movement in, in, in Cuban theater. So I, I you yeah. gestured at that, that there wasn't a lot of conversation, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I know that's not entirely true. So I just wanted to hear a little bit more about that because I think they're two parallel but very distinct um, theatrical traditions that are have been really important for their for their um, respective communities. Right, and so that Chrissy, that is the um, if you want to say kind of canonical teleology and understanding of Chicano theater and of Cuban theater, and so I mean I don't have the time to rehearse right. But what research, and it's actually the archives that are now available to prove, is that that's not the case at all. Um, and so, especially on the West Coast, um, the, like these artists are working, the Cuban artists are working um, since mid 80s. Um, and actually, let me go back. These artists are coming together, Chicano artists and Cuban and Puerto Rican artists, U.S. Cuban and Puerto Rican artists, are coming together first 
in some places in, yes, in California, um, through the playwrights, different playwriting uh, projects. Um, they come together again in New York under Marirene Fornes at Intar. And then at South Coast Rep, um, this is already like late 80s, mid 90s. These are artists that are working alongside each other and are, uh, uh, I mean, they're, they're producing, they're staging, they're directing, they're dramaturging each other's works. Um, and so like Maleta Mulata, for example, um, I mean, it's a bit later, it's 1998, but Maleta Mulata had the actor, I skipped that part, uh, the actresses were uh, a Puerto Rican from New York who had lived in San Francisco since the mid, since the mid 80s. Uh, Cristina Frias, who was, I mean, Chicana, uh, worked with Culture Clash, uh, Teatro Luna, um, I mean, from uh, working in Los Angeles and San Francisco uh, throughout the 80s. Um, and then, of course, uh, uh, Coleman Domingo, the, the African, now famous African American actor. But there you had Ricardo Bracho, um, who, uh, who was. Um, uh, advisor uh, to the group, uh, you had uh, the, uh, I mean, the people who were doing sounds were Chicanos. So they came together um, and they worked and they exchanged and they staged each other, they read each other. Um, so yes, um, Chicano theater from the 1960s is very different from Cuban exile theater that we know that is being produced in Miami and, you know, even in New York at the time. Okay, but uh, the younger Chicano artists, as the U.S. Cubans, they came together and have been working together alongside each other uh, since the mid 1970s, early 80s. And of course, uh, I mean the the women artists, um, especially the performance artists as well. It's just a good yeah. It's it's a good question. Thank you for that presentation. It was beautiful. Um, at the end of your presentation, you said that theater could do something that political science couldn't. Could you talk a little bit more about that? I mean, maybe more specifically, is it something about the inherent processes to theater, or is it something specifically about um, U.S. Cuban theater? Uh, yeah, that's uh, <clears throat> that's a good question. So I don't. Think Think that it's. I think it's. It's something that's specific to theater. Um, the ways in which I mean, and you know this better than I do. Uh, but when one works in a theater project, uh, you need to come together. Um, and uh, the uh, you know the end goal is. I mean, the show must go on, right? It has to go on. In uh, and that happens, of course, in any uh, theatrical situation. Now, what? is specific about the place and the projects that I look at in, that, in this chapter is that given the long um, uh, contested and conflictive histories between Cubans in Miami, well, Cubans in the US and Cubans on the island, the long separation, et cetera, et cetera, that I look at in, in the introductory chapter, um, these two communities were um, you know, were not able to come together, okay? Um, had not been able to come together. Um, and they came together for the first time, um, and this is like proven, um, they come together for the first time through theater, okay? Um, the, uh, I don't want to sound um, uh, like, um, anyway, so like the first, for example, like the first, co-written essay between a Cuban scholar and a Cuban American or a US Cuban scholar was the essay that I wrote in 1993 for TDR with uh, Ines Maria Martia Duterte. And I've checked back, okay? It's the first like co-authored uh, essay. And the projects that continue um, in the case of the, so in the Cuba situation through theater, um, there are a lot of, there are a lot of differences that are ironed out, that are that are put aside. Once you, when, you know, once you work in a production, um, 
um, I mean, you usually um, have no choice but to kind of become friends. You live for a long time, especially in Cuban theater. You rehearse for six hours, eight hours, right? Uh, you have to overcome all of the financial obstacles, which for producing theater, they're the same. Well, actually, believe it or not, they're probably more difficult here in Miami. Well, they were more difficult here in Miami than they were in Cuba at the time. And so it's this coming together, right? The, okay, this coming together and then... Once those performances are out, right, and you've got a, uh, uh, a temporarily gathered community who also partakes, right, of these differences, right? So the fact that you've got Cubans from Miami at the National Theater in Havana, or that you have Cubans from Havana here at, uh, you know, at FIU Performing Arts um, and other spaces. Um, the fact that um, people, uh, exiles who were theater artists who left Cuba in the 60s and 70s are seeing for the first time 30 years later, their colleagues, their mentors, their friends, their teachers, that, um, the affective uh, relationships surface, right? And can go, I mean, I don't know, they can go beyond the political, but they, yeah, they, they force you to, push, to put the political aside. So long story short, no, it's not specific to U.S. Cuban theater, but because of our histories, um, I think it means something very unique um, that that doesn't work quite the same way um, in other, uh, at least Latino, uh, Latino groups. We have time for one more question, if there, if there is one. Yes, please. thank you for your presentation. And it's a little bit of a, I, I'm, well, okay, I, I don't like the it's microphone. Okay, yes. Um, I was just thinking, following on with uh, Logan's question, about audiences, Lillian. In Miami, I mean, theater is an extremely elitist genre. People don't go to the theater, all right? Or at least that's that the culture here. I think that in Havana it's going to be very different, the, the, the theater culture. So I wonder how is it that, you know, this sort of like transformations that theater can do, these interventions, how can they be more effective creating audiences here in Miami, because if not, I mean, like that transformation is not gonna happen, you know, if it remains very isolated. So what are your thoughts about sort of like expanding and creating communities of theater and theater going people who are going to be really enjoying and, 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 and sort of like profiting from what theater can do? Yeah, that's a uh, that's a good question, and it's uh, it's in it, Viviana, it's it's uh, not, it's interesting because I gave a, a presentation like very early in October um, in Spanish at um, um, the Sosa's uh, theater, and um, that was exactly the question that ended, well, that tried to end the discussion and then we went on and on and on for a long time discussing. It's a, it's a difficult question. Yes, it is, uh, I mean, theater tends to be elitist. Um, like some of the, um, but I mean, uh, for example, the, uh, when the, um, the theater performance festival came, um, the prices were relatively low. Uh, at the time, and we did that um, um, a conciencia, um, knowingly. Yeah. Um, so uh, we, you know, we had special, uh, also, I mean, tickets, free tickets for artists who couldn't pay. Um, so I mean, that's one thing that that one can do. Um, now, um, the, the it's not just. I mean, I think the problem here, and everywhere, right, in, in, in the U.S., everywhere, is not so, not everywhere, but let's say Miami, um, it's not so much that uh, theater is expensive and that it's elitist, it's that the kind of theater that is presented um, is not always attractive, especially to the younger communities um, and, uh, I mean, to younger audiences, okay? Um, 
And I don't think it's necessarily a question of, uh, like I'm saying, of cost, but it's really the type of theater, right? The type of plays that are presented. Um, I don't know if you've gone uh, to Miami New Drama, for example, at Miami Beach. Um, I mean, the tickets cost 50 bucks, I think is the lowest one. OK, um, most uh, Spanish theater in Miami tickets go, you know, between 25 and 30, 35. Miami New Drama, it's 50 bucks and up. And the theater is full and it's full. I mean, of mixed audiences, um, of mixed audiences, primarily of mixed twight uh, audiences, with the exceptions of when they do, you know, our town with a multiracial cast. Um, um, and other uh, productions where they actually do try to uh, diversify the audience community. Um, so, um, yeah, um, do different kind of plays. <laughs> and like many say, and don't come with a Cuban story yet once more. We're like, we're fed up. You know, we have other things that we want to look at. And other things that attract us. Up. Uh, let's give another well-deserved round of applause. Thank you so much. Thanks for coming. Thank you.